um, welcome everyone to this last format of Positionen und Diskurse, Go Digital, a format that truly went digital somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and today um, we have an extra session in the Curateria, which is the digital version, version of the Diploma Ausstellung here at ZDK. And me and Basil, we are here in this uh, pool area of the Digital Curateria and we will discuss from here together with Katrin Offentranger, that is also in the Zoom, and Emmanuel Bühler. And I will first make a little intro about Geert Lewink and his work. And then after that, we will, I will give the word over to Geert. And in general, the entire format is interactive, so the chat will be active all the time. So whenever someone has a question or an input, um, we are happy to react, or Geert is happy to react to the, to the chat. And after that, we can have a discussion with everyone involved and see what's, what will happen. So Geert Lovink is a Dutch Australian media scientist and network activist. And he was born 1959 in Amsterdam, where he also studied political science. And after that, after that he made his doctor in Melbourne, Melbourne. And at the moment, he's a professor for new media and interactive media in Amsterdam. And he's the founding director of the Institute of Network Cultures. And he works as a theorist, activist, net critic, and he would like to shape and develop the web. And I think he was already guest before here at Zetreka, like really early in the early stage of position and dis discourse. I don't remember when. Do you remember when? 2000. <laughs> Maybe 2008, something like that. Yeah, I don't remember. But Must be a while ago. <laughs> and I'm sure the web was totally different back then, probably. So that's also why we, um, we've read a text that is actually quite new. You wrote a text set by design, which is the intro of a book that you published in January 2019. So quite new. And... That's what we did like as a preparation for today. Um, yeah, so we are very happy to have you here in a digital version um, for this last format of Positione del Discurse. Do you want to add something? No, no, perfect. Hmm? Everything perfect. Thank you very much. Did I forget anything, Geert? No, it's okay. Let's start. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, very sad that uh, I <laughs> come to uh, Zurich. In fact, um, the lockdown went on uh, in a place uh, on a Sunday night here in the Netherlands, and I think in Switzerland too. Mm -hmm. And I was scheduled to uh, come and fly to Zurich on uh, Monday morning. Yes, uh, exactly. So, it was. Um, it was really quite uh, abrupt. Uh, that uh, my visit uh, to uh, Zurich was uh, cancelled and we even discussed like can I still come or you know uh, it turned out to be uh, impossible and uh, yeah I think it's uh, even three months later it was still impossible so um, this is a, an elegant uh, solution um, yeah in the meanwhile of course uh, you know so much um, has happened to us all to the world um, yeah, I don't feel that my work, uh, you know, the research that I've been doing has uh, completely been um, outdated. Um, but yeah, if you're into critical internet research, you know that, uh, you know, you have to anticipate you have to understand the current situation and especially also you have to understand the dynamics between uh, let's say future design and radical critique 
And uh, this is, these are two things that uh, come together in my work, which means, you know, that, um, yeah, that we had to be prepared, fully prepared for, uh, a, uh, for a lockdown, fully prepared mm. for uh, a, a really very, very big uh, global economic uh, crisis, in, you know, that we are uh, kind of almost at the beginning of uh, right now. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting, let's say, stack of crises, to use the term of Benjamin Breton, that he himself has not yet used. But uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's really a time that we uh, start to understand the interrelationship between the different uh, crises that uh, manifested uh, themselves, let's say, even in um, the period of less than... Um, half a year. Um, for me, 2020 started um, um, in the bush in, uh, in Australia uh, with heavy uh, bushfires uh, in which I, I myself even got uh, caught up, uh, which, uh, you know, for many, many people was an emblematic start of the year, uh, focusing on, uh, you know, severe climate uh, change um, uh, crises that uh, uh, in Australia manifested themselves in such uh, uh, enormous and dramatic uh, ways, right? So this was the start of the year. Um, and um, yeah, what I want to do in this presentation, I want to focus a little bit on um, the things I've been working on over the past uh, two years. And and then making the link to um, the stuff I've been uh, working on in um, in the last uh, yeah half a year or a couple of months, let's say you know. So I will do uh, two things, um, and uh, we'll have a clear um, cut there. Um, in part, maybe also because yeah, there's the question of uh, analysis contemplation, uh, critique, and there's of course now more and more the urgency, again, which has always been there, to act, to strategize, to talk about organization, to talk about change, and of course uh, Black Lives Matters, you know, is a manifestation of, uh, of, of all this, where a lot of things uh, are uh, again uh, coming together. Uh, you know, in my view, in a, in a very uh, positive uh, way, pointing at a, a complete new generation that is uh, willing to go uh, out on the streets uh, to to protest and to, to make uh, radical demands. Um, so, um, yeah, in my work, I've always tried to put the, the two together. But when we are talking about, uh, let's say, the topic of today, uh, sad by design, obviously, we start uh, with um, uh, an analysis, with contemplation, um, and also maybe with, uh, you know, self-examination, um, if you like. Mm -hmm. Namely, uh, how we, or how I, how the self, uh, has been caught up in this uh, technological frame uh, called social media platforms, right? Um, and before I will read a few fragments from uh, the uh, the social media, the social uh, side by design um, book uh, uh, on uh, platform nihilism, uh, which is the, the subtitle. Uh, I will tell a little bit about uh, the background of this book because uh, in there you can see uh, the different um, topics and uh, different elements um, of my work and I think of, of the, the general network uh, condition uh, coming, coming together. The book Sad by Design is, uh, is the sixth book in my, uh, my series. So every few years I, I kind of summarize what um, you know what I've uh, what I've done and where the internet is the kind of state-of-the-art uh, report if you like 
This last one uh, was dominated by the period after Brexit and Trump. So the book really deals with the situation after uh, 2016. And now we can retrospectively really also say, you know, it is a book that really uh, frames the situation, let's say, from uh, Brexit uh, early 16 to uh, late 19, um, the period, let's say, before, uh, before COVID, uh, Black Lives Matter, and everything that's going to come in, in the next <laughs> couple of months, because yeah, the world is upside down and we can expect many, many more things. Yeah? Uh, we're suddenly, um, you know, um, only at the very beginning of uh, very, very turbulent uh, times ahead. Okay, so uh, we're talking about uh, a period uh, uh, the last three years, which have been, uh, you know, dominated, in my view, by this, uh, this term uh, called regression, or we call it, could also call it stagnation. And some people say that the last period was a completely a, a, a phase in which uh, the world has completely uh, failed to understand uh, the, the current situation. Elites were unable and unwilling to do anything to address any of the serious issues, right? And this really neatly comes together in this beautiful uh, term called regression, right? where things just, you know, uh, are refusing to move on. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the term was also uh, theorized in a really nice way in, a, in a, an original uh, German publication that was, uh, that was published uh, in English and a couple of other real uh, European um, uh, kind of theory consortium, if you like, a coalition of different people who were trying to uh, theorize uh, this uh, uh, this stagnation uh, that we faced, right? Um, obviously, uh, in the in the in the period of Black Lives Matters and even in the period of COVID, hmm, funny enough, uh, we did not experience this as a period of uh, stagnation, right? So we can uh, say that the, the period of stagnation. Mm -hmm. Uh, really is over. Hmm? Even though we had to s sit down uh, and uh, do nothing, hmm? uh, this was already a, a really, really big move forward in, in a very funny uh, way. So the dialectics uh, are really playing uh, a very, very uh, a strange uh, game uh, with us, right? When we, come, when, we, when we come out of a phase of regression and stagnation by doing nothing. Huh? Um, but yeah, this is uh, kind of how it uh, turned out uh, to be. Um, in the book, uh, yeah, so I have a, a couple of chapters with, that deal with this uh, question of um, where we are. One of them uh, deals more or less with, uh, you know, distraction. Um, apart from sadness, uh, I think what the, the social media, of course, do, and we, we know a lot about that and we read a lot about it, yeah? Is that they constantly distract us, and some of them, some of us are, are really uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, a victim uh, of this. Uh, some of us uh, are better uh, at it to to manage this, but the distraction uh, is systematic, right? And this is also what we can say about sadness. Sadness is not just oh, I feel bad or you know, I'm, uh, I'm a bit down and out or uh, I, I'm, I'm depressed. No, we know that. It's quite similar to the distraction. These are things that have been built into the software, built into the, the code, into the algorithms that, that try to, um, you know, bring us in a certain psychological mood. And the, the internet research of the last couple of years has been, uh, luckily, uh, you know, very, very much uh, promoting uh, a further investigation how uh, the social media and our psychic uh, state uh, are becoming uh, intertwined 
uh, in a way that you know we can uh, no longer distinguish uh, them properly. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, that's the topic of set by design. After that um, comes a short uh, chapter, which I, um, is more programmatic. And uh, I'm saying something about it here because I will talk about it in the second part. In, in a short chapter, um, I compare also biographically three terms, key terms that in my view uh, have defined the last three decades. Namely, one is media, second is networks, third is platform, right? And I asked, how do media, networks, and platforms relate? In part, in, I describe it there, it's also uh, a biographical thing, namely that, uh, you know, me coming from the 80s and 90s generation is very much a generation, you know, that struggled with the media question. And my, myself have then, uh, you know, developed uh, a number of uh, concepts there. The most famous one being uh, tactical media, uh, the activist uh, part of it. Uh, but there are so many others. And there's, of course, new media. I don't know. Is, is, are there still new media in Zurich? I'm not really sure. Huh? New media? Heard of it? No? New yeah. Media? yeah. So some, in some places, people still remember what new media. Uh, in, in others, uh, you know, it, it has, has completely lost uh, its, uh, its meaning, right? Um, in some places, people, uh, you know, have tried to uh, do something with the idea of digital media, which I think is a paradox because all media are digital uh, these days. So uh, then, you know, it immediately provokes the question, uh, do you mean, uh, you know, in them in, in, uh, in comparison to analog media maybe, or, uh, you know, I, do you want to go back to the analog media e era? Hmm? Do you still have a VHS player at home and all this? No, I mean, it's probably not about that. Um, so, uh, so digital media, yeah, it's, it's kind of, uh, an, um, or uh, it, it is, um, uh, yeah, it's not uh, re very meaningful. Anyway, so that's the whole trajectory of the media, mm -hmm. and and then of course there are the uh, the old media as well, and some people still study the old media like journalism or radio, television, uh, film, uh, uh, not to forget, and they are of course very powerful. And then there is that strange idea that has already disappeared by now, called the, the new media. Um, and nobody has really heard uh, anything about new media uh, since quite some time. Uh, so they've, they've completely gone. Um, so, uh, and then 90s uh, were, and the period after the word really defined about this idea of the network. And the network there you see the rise of the social, social networks, um, uh, communities, uh, computer networks, of course, and there you see the, the where the, the technical and the social are kind of coming together, you know? where, and uh, where we cannot really distinguish the two anymore. Because when we use the term network, we're not really quite sure anymore. Are you referring to a technical network or? Hmm? or your the bunch of friends uh, you know that you have or your family or uh, the people you uh, you know interact with in uh, in the school right okay um, and then of course since um, uh, almost 10 years let's say after the the global financial crisis uh, also the breakdown of web 2.0 we see the rise of the platforms, right? And this is, of course, the era we are in right now. And this is an era where, um, you know, we have left behind the kind of the romantic, the uh, rhizomatic notion of the decentralized uh, network hmm? and face uh, ourselves with uh, the, uh, the social, economic and technological reality of the large platforms being Facebook, Google, uh, Network, uh, Amazon, uh, Uber, um, Alibaba, um, Airbnb, uh, you name it. The, the list goes on and on and on, right? And we know platforms are all 
very uh, you know centralized um, beasts that uh, have an inherent ten tendency to uh, you know create a monopoly and then uh, within the platform then start to uh, work as a kind of uh, as a meta um, instrument to bring together for instance uh, you know supply and demand hmm? think of uber you know where uber kind of is a, is a very large platform and it brings together the taxi drivers and uh, the people who are looking for a taxi or um, yeah or in, in the case of amazon mm, the, the the people who are looking for a book and the book publishers and so on and so on or uh, booking.com where you have a hotel and uh, that brings together the people who are looking for a, a hotel room yeah so the, the, this is a, this is the platform uh, for, for from logic and uh, so this is what uh, where we are uh, right now and we cannot really um, discuss uh, the social media uh, you know without a, a, a proper understanding of uh, of the of the platform uh, logic and what it what it is right because you know, one of the problems there is really that we find that we are trapped and why do we feel we are trapped right it's this also this kind of sadness is produced by the fact that you know we are in uh, we find ourselves in an abyss uh, going down but but we can't really um, leave right and this is also kind of uh, in you know, the big disappointment and uh, defeat, if you like, of all activist approaches uh, to come up uh, with an alternative. You know, why are there no, uh, let's say, artistic, you know, alternatives uh, to the social media platforms? Why are all artists, uh, you know, almost uh, condemned uh, to use Instagram, hmm? right? Why is that? Why, why, why haven't the artists just started up their their own uh, image uh, sharing boards or something like that right why are we um, inherently huh, uh, locked down and and feel that also even as teachers uh, even as very very alternative people we we, uh, we are incapable uh, of uh, of um, you know organizing ourselves to, to come up with uh, a, di a different um, logic uh, and even if we believe in very small scale um, alternatives and uh, places where people can develop our t the, their talent or alternatives uh, we uh, even then find ourselves uh, in a situation that uh, this is happening kind of uh, inside uh, the big platforms right so this is kind of where we where we are. Um, okay, um, I'm now going to try to share um, the um, yeah. I don't know if it works, but okay, I'm going to look if um, um, yeah. Can show you some of the pictures. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then we'll see. Um, so um, I'm going to start now to read some of the. Uh, fragments that I've uh, chosen for this occasion um, from the Sad by Design essay. Let's dive into social media weariness, the cause of our tired eyes. What are the techniques of resignation that we are exposed to? the blissful ignorance after browsing an entire ecosystem of narratives is not surprising. Culture is a pendulum and the pendulum is swaying. The organized optimism 
hard coded in online advertisements and other forms of algorithmic advice turned out to be merely producing anxiety. As Caroline Coles Richard stated, what can't be cured must be endured. The suffering, sorrow, and misery is getting tagged and filtered by our own self-censorship. We've been captured and feel frozen. What we receive is the anger and anxiety of the online other. The growing imbalance in the distribution of digital enchantment is neither causing a revolution or revolt, nor does it fade out. Welcome to the great stagnation. We, the online billions, are stuck on the platform. Once we're locked in, the past to infinity has been blocked. Instead, we're caught in a Truman Show-like repetition of the perpetual now. Toiling around in the micro mess of online others that try to do their best, masking their failures and despair like anyone else. Franco Berardi observes the mental state of today's students. I quote, I see them from my window, he writes, lonely, watching the screens of their smartphones, nervously rushing to classes, sadly going back to the expensive rooms that their families are renting for them. I see their gloom. I feel the aggressiveness latent in their depression. In the social media era, the Oblomov effect is no longer an option, in particular for those that cannot economically afford to get stuck in the abyss. We experience the sadness of online existentialism minus the absurdity. If only interpassivity was really implemented in code instead of just being another Austrian idea. We would indulge in a permanent state of indolent apathy. Instead, we're not passive about human machine interactions. Being on social, the Zen status of detachment is an ontological impossibility. We're never really lurking. Our presence is always noted and we can uh, therefore never truly enjoy the secretive wire status. Right? We're never really passive wire because even our the way we watch something is recorded, interpreted, stored, turned into data, sold to third parties. Interaction is our tragic existence. Instead, we're constantly asked to upgrade, fill in forms and rank our taxi drivers. In his 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts right now, Jaron Lanier asks, why do so many famous tweets end with the word sad? He associates the word with a lack of real connection. Why must people accept manipulation by a third party as the price of a connection? According to Lanier, sadness appears in response to, I quote, unreasonable standards for beauty or the social status or vulnerability to trolls. 
Google and Facebook know how to utilize negative emotions more readily, leading to the new system-wide goal. Find personalized ways to make you feel bad. There's no single way to make everyone unhappy. Compared to others, your ranking is low. And this makes you sad. Even technological sadness is a style. Abide a cold one. The sorrow, no matter how short, is real. This is what happens when we can no longer distinguish between telephone and society. If we can't freely change our profile and feel too weak to delete the app, we're condemned to feverishly check for updates during the brief in-between moments of our busy lives. In a split second, the real-time machine has teleported us out of our current situation and onto another playing field filled with mini reports we quickly have to investigate. Omnipresent social media places a claim on our elapsed time, our fractured lives. We're all sad in our very own way. As there are no lulls or quiet moments anymore, the result is fatigue, depletion, and loss of energy. We're becoming obsessed with waiting. How long have you been forgotten by your loved ones? Time, meticulously measured on every app, tells us right to your face. Kronos hurts. Should I post something to attract attention and show that I'm still here? Nobody likes me anymore. As the random messages keep relentlessly piling in, there's no way to hold them. Am I still here? As the rentless messages keep relentlessly, relentlessly piling in, there's no way to hold them, to take a moment and think it all through. Delacroix once declared that every day, which is not noted, is like a day that does not exist. Diary writing used to fulfill that task. Elements of early blog culture tried to update the diary form for the online realm, but that moment has now passed. Unlike the blog entries of the Web 2.0 era, social media have surpassed the summary state of the diary in a desperate attempt to keep up with the real-time regime. Instagram stories, for instance, bring back the nostalgia of an unfolding chain of events and then disappear at the end of the day. Like a revenge act, a satire of ancient sentiments gone by. Storage will make the pain permanent. Better forget about it and move on. In the online context, sadness appears as a short moment of indecisiveness, a flash that opens up the possibility of a reflection. The frequently used sad label is a, a vehicle, a strange attractor to enter the liquid mass called social media. Sadness is a container. Each and every situation can potentially be qualified as sad. Through this mild form of suffering, we enter the blues of being in the world. When something is sad, things around it become gray. You trust the machine because you feel 
you're in control of it. You want to go from zero to hero. But then your propped up ego implodes. And the failure of self-esteem becomes apparent again. The price of self-control in an age of instant gratification is high. We no longer revolt against the restless zombie inside us, but we don't know how. We want to, but we don't know how. Our psychic armor is thin and eroded from within, open to behavioral modifications. Sadness arises at the point we're exhausted by the online world. After yet another app session in which we failed to make a date, purchased a ticket and did a quick round of videos, the post-dopamine phase hits us hard. The sheer busyness and self-importance of the world makes you feel joyless. After a dive into the network, we're drained and feel socially awkward. The swiping finger is tired and we have to stop. Let's compare the fleeting sadness and its technical in its technical form with the ancient state of melancholy. The melancholic personality seems to suffer from a disease, unable to act. He or she withdraws from the world, contemplating death and other transient phenomena. While some read this condition as depression and boredom, others reframe this lazy passivity as a creative strategy, waiting for inspiration to strike. Instead of a fascinating derive into the vast arsenal of literary sources, I propose here a digital hermeneutics that shortcuts philology with the eternal presence of the digital that surrounds us. Melancholy, often describes as sadness without a cause, has strong existential connotations. While playing tribute to Kierkegaard, who liberated melancholia once and for all of its medical stigma, describing it as the deepest foundation of the human in a godless society, the problem here is not a vertical one of going deeper, but a horizontal one. My work always deals with the horizontal, the problem of the interface, the problem of the surface, the surfing on the surface, so, so to say. It's very tempting to go deep, of course, but I fear our culture does not really uh, allow that, let alone facilitate. The democratization of sadness happens through its thin spread across, across our plateau, or the flatness. We feel flat. We are flat. Homeopathic doses flatly distributed by a technical means. Melancholia is a thing of the past because there is simply no time anymore, anymore to indulge in a wistful state. Yeah, so we long for melancholia, but we're not really melancholic. There's simply no time for that. And only the very rich you know, can afford to have some kind of offline uh, experience. And, but most of us uh, also for, for, for social, 
psychological and uh, for cultural reasons, uh, we cannot uh, uh, allow ourselves uh, to be uh, more than, uh, you know, just a few hours uh, offline. So there's simply no, uh, no possibility to really become or indulge into melancholia. One could, of course, defend that techno sadness still bears the possibility of melancholia. The implosion of the fact of time has all but sabotaged the possibility to seriously drift off. Real time machine constantly draws back online, capture our attention, do not allow extensive mourning. Strangely, melancholia requires concentration and focus. Distracting on the others on, is uh, all over the place and sadness is microdosed. The metric uh, to measure today's sim symptoms would be time or attention as it is called in the tech industry. And so there's no um, uh, really an, an awareness of time. Time is measured, economized, sold uh, as attention. While for the archaic, melancholic, the past never passes, techno sadness is caught in the perpetual now. Forward focused, we bet on acceleration and never mourn a um, lost object. The primary in the identification is there in our hand. Everything is evident on the screen, right in your face. While confronted with the rich historical sources that dealt with melancholia, the contrast with our present condition becomes immediately apparent. Whereas melancholia in the past was defined by separation from others, reduced contacts and reflection on oneself, today's tristesse plays itself out amidst, amidst busy social media interactions. In Sherry Turkle's phrase, we are alone together as part of the crowd, a form of loneliness that is particularly cruel, frantic, and tiring. What we see today are systems that constantly disrupt the timeless aspect of melancholia. There's simply no time for contemplation or Weltschmerz. Social reality does not allow us to retreat. Even in our deepest state of solitude, we're surrounded by online others that babble on and on, demanding our attention. But distraction does not just take us away from the world. Yeah? The distraction we face is not there to take us away from, let's say, work. This is the old, if still prevalent, way of framing the fatal attraction of smartphones. No, distraction does not pull us away, but instead draws us back into the social. And this is something we find very difficult uh, to accept. Social reality as manufactured by the technical platforms, is the magic realm where we belong. That's where the tribes gather, and that's the place to be on top of the world. Social real relations in real life have lost their supremacy. The idea of going back to the village mentality of the place, formerly known as real life, is daunting indeed. How can re redesign the social in such a way that uh, it will become impossible 
even unthinkable for trolls and bots and uh, algorithms that try to permanently disrupt, disrupt our thinking and, uh, our, and behavior to occur. We cannot spend all the time and energy to reinvent the social without taking freedom into account. Not the liberty as defined by the right-wing libertarians, but freedom as Hannah Arendt and Isaac Berlin talk about. This is not just freedom from addictive and manipulative software. Can we rethink and uh, bots and algorithms in such a way that they become pets or toys, tools that work for us instead of invisible oppressive systems that try to deceive and educate us? Technological freedom means the ability to put them aside. We long for tools that assist us instead of colonizing our inner lives behind our backs. Our sadness will not be overcome with anger. Okay, so this is the first part of uh, materials uh, from the book, but also a bit more uh, recent materials. Um, by the way, this comes uh, with music. Uh, we, we can't play music, uh, I understood. Um, very soon. Um, we can actually. Oh, we can? Oh. All right. <laughs> um, I, uh, I've produced an, uh, an album with eight songs uh, together with uh, a friend of mine. Um, our um, music um, duo, if you like, uh, is called uh, We Are Not Sick. And uh, this is a reference to uh, Susan Zontag, of course. Um, and um, yeah, we we're about to launch this um, this album with uh, with songs, and um, maybe you've heard or noted um, that um, we've had two uh, performances, then uh, interrupted by um, COVID, of course. Uh, one uh, in November in Utrecht at Impact Festival, and um, another one in. Um, um, the um, most beautiful Berlin uh, Volksbühne uh, during the uh, Transmediale Festival, where we performed uh, together. And so uh, very soon, uh, so th uh, the album will will come will come out. And then there's, I think, already uh, one one song available. Um, if you go to the uh, We Are Not Sick dot com website. Um, I will read some parts now of a recent text in which I'm trying to deal with the um, um, with the question of the platform. You know, what is the platform? Why can't we why, and why, why can't we leave the platform? Why are we stuck there? Um, because, yeah, this is the, um, this is kind of the overall uh, question uh, in the background. And uh, funny enough, uh, both COVID um, and Black Lives Matter um, have not prompted us in any way to leave the platform. So, um, or to, you know, really um, radically uh, oppose its logic. So even though we can see there is, um, let's say, um, a discontent in, in the platform, um, there are not yet ways for us uh, to leave it. So I'll, 
I'll read a little bit more and then we, we start the discussion. During the 2020 lockdown, the internet experienced its first sense of completion, its vollendung. Some video call, some video calls may have frozen. Laptops and routers had to be restarted, but remarkably few, few people complained about a systematic dysfunctionality of the internet. This is it. The network has reached its full potential. We use it for social media, work, entertainment, to order food, see how our friends and family are going. What else do we want during a lockdown? For sure, teletransportation. Circumvent those trains and airports. We need to go back to science fiction novels to read up what we, again, all wished for in the future. What we need is a better body, an instant vaccine. What we desire is less tech to go offline, travel, leave the damned cage, no more internet. The, in the inertia upholds contradictions until the body gets bored, distracted, and ultimately collapses. The question in all these weeks of Corona was ultimately why video conferencing, what we're doing right now here in this lecture as well, is so exhausting. Why are meetings on Skype, Teams, Zoom, Hangul, Google Hangout and so on so draining? Please note that there is not a trace of inter interface critique here. Right, interface critique, it's a 90s thing. Never heard of again. <laughs> An even varied multiplicity of voices, moods, and opinions is not really desirable. Please give us less. Do we need more indications of the group sentiments, more back channels, maybe? But there's already enough multitasking happening anyway. We do not need to design more of that. If anything, we need more focus. Our digital alter ego whispers in our earphones. The software keeps us at bay. We see ourselves participating in the meeting. Look at Zoom right now. Look at yourself. Thanks to my image on the screen, I'm conscious of myself, not only from within, but also from without. We are always, to some degree, interna internally conscious of ourselves. As Sakarakas describes, the experiment as a double event, the human mind experience as, as if we're real. The, this requires more mental energy, right? Why is it so exhausting? Video calls are, I quote, physically, connect, cognitively, and emotionally taxing experience for many excuses, for many users, as our mind undertake the work of making thanks the sense of things under such circumstances, right? So we, we, we screen, we try to understand the new situation with our minds and brains are not really geared for that, at least not yet. We might think of it as a case of ordinary unconscious processes that operate at max capacity to help us make sense of what we're experiencing. We are forced to be more attentive 
and cannot merely drift off. Right? Again, there's a, uh, the, that impossibility. So if only we, we could go on a derive, you know, if only uh, we could really uh, get distracted. But these systems, they don't really uh, allow us uh, to do that. Um, the social and sometimes even machinic surveillance takes its toll. This requires new forms of daydreaming, online absence in a situation of permanent presence. Platforms are aspirational media. We go there because we are searching for something, right? So the platforms are not ontological. We, we are not there, just sitting there. We, we need to do something. We need to look for something. Yet, unlike the rational, cold and empty search engines designed by engineers and library scientists, platforms offer personalized fuzzy information for the dazed and confused, right? So search engines are still kind of scientific in a way. Um, it deals with information. Yeah? Platforms, on the other hand, are, are entirely psychological, right? And they, the main designers, as we know from all the stories from inside Silicon Valley, are behavioral scientists, right? Funny enough, the psychologists have taken over from the geeks. And it's the psychologists who tell the geeks what to code. This is a strange yet not yet really theorized um, turn of events, if you like. Platforms, uh, as gated safe spaces. They know us personally, right? They, they remember us. Also, also because we just have to uh, log in there, right? There's no uh, platform without the profile, right? There's no profile-less platform. Of course, these services exist, as you know, uh, but they are much older ones. They're usually forum software, image board, um, software and so on and so on, yeah? where you can just uh, be either anonymous or use a pseudonym. Mm -hmm. the, the platforms, uh, they are all um, profile centric, right? They do not exist without the profile. So platform remember us and know how to comfort and trigger us. We messy humans do not like to start from scratch. And this is why we feel so attracted to it. Imagine if you would go to a platform and, would, and every time you go there, you know, it asks, who are you huh? and so on. What are your preferences? Hmm? No, the machine remembers and we love that. Hmm? We love that the machine, hmm, uh, you know, uh, takes a personal approach towards us. We have to save time. That's the main thing. Always take the shortcuts and appreciate that the machine actually remembers and talks to us, tells us how close the Uber driver is, what uh, comparable uh, products cost elsewhere, and what uh, this uh, or that uh, customer that just showed up is sharing with others. We're petty, break down easily as our busy multitasking lives are on the brink of collapse anyway, all the time. This is why we find comfort on the platform, our new virtual domicile, formerly known as the homepage. The platform world is one that prefers fluid effort over dragging complexity, right? So we demand that the platforms are very simple. Comf this is what comforts us. 
think of Facebook's childish interface design. The problem here is that there is nothing to think about. Whereas billions spent uh, hours uh, a day on Facebook, only few of us will be able to reconstruct how this particular website looks and what happens there. It somehow looks blue, uh, has a news feed, updates inhabited by random friends. However, this is not done out of naivety. While the data extraction largely happens out of sight, mm. offline in a data center, crunching the numbers, combining different data sources, we remain hyper aware of our privacy. This is not a contradiction. The act of giving away privacy sensitive in information is a private one. We know ads are targeted at us. In fact, we feel pleased to be addressed as unique individuals. And this is why we do not consider ourselves victims. We do not need to be informed, let alone liberated. Aspirational life is an endless succession of prototypes, versions, halfway attempts that later get aborted and forgotten. The digital reflects this. It is never real or material, hovering between the status of pro proposal and the point after things expire. We resent the objects that are unable to simply be in the world. High tech is unable to merely exist. It's always on the verge of not working when the battery runs out, the service, uh, uh, the software as service subscription has run out and the connection is temporarily not available. It's a premium feeling to pay with the promise that one day we may get paid ourselves. Okay, I'll leave it here. The, the platform theory uh, is still in, um, in development. Uh, as, I, um, as I said, uh, primarily uh, in response to Nick Chernick's uh, book uh, called Platform Capitalism, but also Benjamin Bretton's uh, book, uh, The Stack. Um, there are uh, unfortunately not so many um, theoretical uh, references uh, yet uh, to be made, but um, yeah, it's early days uh, for that. Um, in the same way as um, you know, we we try to envision uh, um, what comes after the platform, but uh, yeah, that's uh, still um, unclear. Okay, let's uh, now um, move to the um, um, the discussion. Thanks for um, staying with us. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ged, for this uh, interesting um, reading. Um, I think Emmanuel and Catherine, they're also here. Yes, hello. Somewhere. <laughs> yep. Thank you very much, Ged. They're here. <laughs> Who is screen shooting? Shiba <laughs> Katrin. That's me. Okay. Well, um, we have talked about um, how can we personally, as individuals, do something against this social media sadness? And how can we develop a responsible handling as individuals? Um, against this sadness in social media yeah. because as um, as we were talking together about uh, this text from Gerd we were like um, like uh, confused a bit because we don't have always this sadness and maybe it's because we have a not, another handling with these platforms sometimes or I don't know. 
maybe it's also because for example i don't have facebook myself mm -hmm. and maybe so i don't hang out a lot on these platforms not as much as other people maybe i don't know but yes the question is how can we personally um what can we do yeah to stop the sadness or is it our responsibility as individuals or, or is it the responsibility of these developers from these platforms what do you think okay sadness is a uh, you know i'm trying to um emphasize that is one uh, you know it's almost a random uh, feeling uh, there are many feelings there are many responses and ways to respond mm -hmm. um, i've uh, zoomed in on this one uh, being uh, acutely aware that uh, there are many others and that there are many uh, kind of gender race cultural uh, you know uh, forms um, um different ways to to respond um of course there's the gender critique saying sadness is female right and then uh the the way the usual male way to respond is uh anger right and so that's also why most of the the, the research is of course based on uh has to deal with anger anger management uh, mm -hmm. and all this right uh, um, that ranges from, uh, let's say, the, the more political, journalistic responses, namely uh, to um, uh, to fight uh, so-called fake news, uh, um, yeah, and um, the, the ways, uh, for instance, a lot of males are uh, kind of uh, you know going on and and um, feel attracted to uh, conspiracy theories and uh, cannot really uh, control uh, their emotions very well uh, on these platforms when they uh, start to engage in a discussion. Right? And in part, there are also ageist uh, sides of that, saying that the, it's particularly the older white male that is the main problem here, right? Um, okay, that's one, that's one, and that's a world that we know, hear about most, right? The sadness that I've studied, we, we don't hear so much about it. It's more indirect, it's more fluid. Um, it's more, you know, obviously kind of related. It's a mild form, you could say, of uh, depression. Hmm? Depression is obviously, uh, you know, it's a, it's a medical category. You can look it up, right? Um, and that's why uh, I wrote in that text, um, you know, everybody can be sad, but not everybody can be depressed, right? Not everybody is depressed. <laughs> yeah. And I agree that, uh, you know, when you read, uh, read this text, and you can also say, well, this is about other people. It does not concern me. And I, I'm, I'm uh, completely fine. Uh, with that, you know, I mean, it's really lucky if you if you are not caught in the social media and have found a way to escape them, good on you, you know, and please, uh, you know, tell others <laughs> how you did it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, unfortunately, uh, if we look at, uh, you know, the, the statistics, and if we look in society, if you go on a bus, a metro or a train, <laughs> you will quickly find uh you know that uh, there's something else happening right you may be uh, happy that uh, you are not uh, addicted uh but uh very soon you will find out that uh, a lot of people around you huh, are somewhat uh, you know un incapable of uh of putting the phone um, putting it aside and yeah so but you know okay, uh, individual uh responses i'm always uh, very interested uh, in in them and uh, i'm very interested also in in describing you know other uh, psychological states i'm quite far into another essay which 
deals with the question of loneliness, for instance. It's very, very often related to this topic. Not so many people talk about it. Or, but of course, during the COVID crisis, we've heard a lot, uh, again, about it, or at least the fear of um, of loneliness in these long, uh, you know, weeks and months uh, that we are, uh, that we were under uh, lockdown. And so I would say in the, in the next couple of months or in half a year, we will hear much, much more about uh, the psychological damage hmm, that uh, this has, uh, has done. Again, in relation to social media, which is very strange. Because how can you study social loneliness as a social media phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. Because they seem such, um, yeah, they seem so contradictory. But uh, all the um, research is pointing in another direction. May I ask something? Of course. Um, When Emmanuel asked his question, you one could understand that social media and platforms are identical. Mm -hmm. And are you, are you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's uh, that's uh, very true. Um, however. Um, we need to distinguish here between, uh, you know, what the Italians do. Italians have a lovely way of confusing all these things in their language, eh? as they often uh, do. Uh, they're very, uh, you know, poetic people. And the Italians refuse really to talk about the social media and they have kept something alive, an idea, namely social networking. Hmm? And so the Italians still talk about social networking. And I think this is really, really interesting. Hmm? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a term that uh, really uh, is banned in Silicon Valley. You don't find it anywhere, right? Hmm? Because social networking has, you know, very, very different uh, connotations. That's why the term social media huh, has become so, so mm -hmm. dominant. Um, and yes, social media, I think, cannot happen hmm, without uh, the centralized platform. Huh? But the social networking can happen in many, many ways. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so if, if there is a way out or if, if there are artistic practices or, um, you know, um, alternative ways, huh? I always think of, uh, you know, to go one step back in time. And say if there is anything eh, we should focus on the social networking mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. but um looking at what we are talking about not from the social media perspective but from the platform perspective couldn't we say that social media are just one platform of many and because amazon for example is by no way is a social media platform but it is a platform uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Amazon cannot exist, uh, you know, without its customers. There's no way. Um, so, uh, of course, you could say, for a large, to a large extent, we don't see anything of the uh, of the traces of the millions of people who are out there. But we also have a sense, uh, and they they give us many many clues. Um, in the way they uh, they've organized the, the interfaces, this, uh, the the algorithmic uh, you know recommendations that they do, and you constantly see other people huh? because they, it often says you know other customers bought this. Uh, that, that's a, that's a really um, uh, you know famous one. But uh, of course, Amazon is also depending, for instance, on the reviews of the customers mm -hmm. and there, there's a whole industry set up there huh? and and policing of it with thousands of editors who work you know on a daily basis um, to uh, kind of manage and keep this reviewing system up uh, uh, and uh, going right 
because obviously there are commercial interests to manipulate the reviews, as we know from uh, you know hotels and restaurants. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, there are also ways, uh, you know, political uh, motives uh, to write, a, you know, a bad review of a, of a book, uh, for instance, or, or a product, or not another product. So um, yeah, so other people are really, really important uh, there, and if and if we if we do not feel them, if we do not sense their presence, we quickly get uh, suspicious. <laughs> yeah, if anyone has any questions from from the listeners, then you can just type it into the chat. Or just ask loud actually. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could also talk about a little bit about like these current protests that are going on. Like on Saturday in Zurich, there were more than 10,000 people on the streets for Black Lives Matter. And I was talking to my cousin and she's like 14 years. Yeah. And I had the strong feeling that social media had a huge role in like how so many young people actually were brought together to actually yeah. get active in real life in an analog way and mm -hmm. actually be present in reality on the streets that's very very true and that's yeah a sense we get from from everywhere um, now we can uh, distinguish there between uh, let's say this kind of mood that uh, uh, you know has uh, has been boiling up and has been uh, created for for quite some time because remember uh, Black Lives Matter or the protests against racism, even worldwide, is by no means a 2020 uh, phenomenon, right? Even in the United States. Uh, okay, this is the, the biggest, uh, you know, uh, uprising as of yet, right? But uh, this has been with us for, for many, many years. In, in the very same way as we could, uh, could say that, uh, you know, of the climate change uh, protests. So, that have uh, you know so many predecessors and uh, things that uh, have led to this uh, situation, right? Of many many years and even decades. That's that's clear here. The, and the social media have kind of created that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let's say, collective mood amongst especially young people. However, um, there is a big difference uh, between, let's say, this urge to to come on the street and to mod to do something and the question of how today a social movement is organizing itself and how a, a social movement like this one should do that and if uh, at all uh, social move social media are playing any role in this right and this is where in my view the the interesting things start not so much on this on the one of mobilization, but on the question of, um, yeah, to, to, pull, to call it, uh, you know, in the old term way of grassroots um, bottom up organization. And social media now are very good in rare cases, very much in a responsive and defensive way to bring young people out on the street they completely fail huh, when it comes to um, set up, um, you know, grassroots or, or um, bottom-up um, uh, initiatives, right? If you look at it uh, here in the Netherlands, it's very, very clear. Uh, the, the people really who organized it, who are behind it, huh, they all met years and years ago. There's no, 
role there uh, of social media whatsoever. I'm not saying social media is blocking them mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. organize or self-organize. That's not true. But what we can uh, clearly uh, show that um, the social media as such have not uh, really uh, been very helpful because they are not really organizational tools. Right, and, and so especially Facebook is very, very keen to disencourage people to use it for organizational matters, right? If you look at how dysfunctional something like Facebook groups is in comparison to the fantastic software that is out there on the mm -hmm. internet, you know, for, for self-organization, which is phenomenal. Um, and so the, the technical possibilities that we have for self-organization is, is really, really great. However, none of that, I would say on purpose, is offered to us on the social media platforms themselves. Including, of course, you know, decision-making, consensus, uh, real debate, and so on and so on. Yeah? Try to have a real debate. It's a disaster. Any, you know, 20 year, uh, years old software does a better job there which tells you something, you know, about, again, you know, the, the, the culture of regression that in my view has, uh, has been designed. This is not, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is done on purpose. Hmm. Um, I also have a question. Yes. Hi. Um, so I guess, hi, 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 my name is Trinity. Um, so I guess as a professor, you are aware of the concept of trigger warnings and safe spaces in um, American elite universities. And um, this, I mean, this is the concept which I guess for people from a certain age, um, I'm personally um, 30 years old, um, this this concept kind of sounds quite um, sh shocking to me <laughs> that you know within a sort of academic sort of um, um, sort of well in a situation of academic discourse um, you can um, sort of make clear of a situation where you feel uncomfortable of a topic and be placed in, a, in some sort of like um, isolation. Um, but now when I think about it, um, isn't this essentially just an extension of the safe spaces that exist within social media um, today? Yes, it is. Um, but um, yeah, if you want to look into the research, uh, this has been dealt with uh, a little bit uh, earlier on let's say uh, a bit more like uh, five or eight years ago, um, a lot of us were trying to understand, you know, the whole logic, for instance, of uh, filter bubbles, hmm? where, where people kind of, uh, you know, come together huh? and they, they don't really understand why <laughs> uh, they're in a space and, you know, there's no real dissent. Huh? There's no real, uh, uh, they don't hear anything uh, that upsets them anymore or, um, yeah. And th this is all filtered out and the machines are, uh, you know, uh, uh, programmed and coded, uh, designed uh, in such a way that uh, this uh, no longer um, uh, happens. Wendy uh, Chung is uh, someone who uh, has also uh, more theoretically on the media theory uh, level um, hom homophilia, uh, she calls it, yeah? um, where uh, machines, algorithms, and uh, um, interface designs, um, recommendation systems have all been designed to uh, exclude uh, the online other. So, yeah, one, one could say that uh, the social media as we know them now, yeah, are a product of uh, of that, right? This this is just uh, now today. This is the default. 
and you have to put in a lot of extra work and fight the algorithms to meet someone you know you dislike yeah Um, yeah. <laughs> Is there anyone else having a question or was the answer clear to you, Trinity? Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it, it kind of relates to another question I have, but I'm, 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 I don't really know how to like, how to phrase it. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's. I guess, yeah, no, there's, there's no way to like phrase this question in a way that's, that could actually create a real discussion, <laughs> you know, in relation to like censorship on social media. Like for example, mm -hmm. um, if there's one, if there's one um, topic where many, many friends of my, many friends of mine and myself kind of disagree is this concept of, oh, you know, if, if someone, on our platform um, makes a, a, a negative comment or a statement that we disagree with, we must delete it. And I'm thinking, no, like we shouldn't. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand this concept of just simply um, dealing with a, with, a, with a problem or a situation simply, simply by making it disappear. Um, what I enjoyed in my early sort of social media use days was this, exactly this idea of having these kind of long online discussions or debates or whatever. Um, of course, um, there's, there's, there's always situations where you can not, no longer debate with someone who, who has a very, very specific set of ideas, but I don't, I don't really understand. I don't see the, the benefits in simply deleting or, 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 or diminishing um, anything which goes, any comments or, or, or any opinions that kind of um, leave our, you know, a common uh, an understanding that's that's common am amongst a certain group. Um, but yeah, then again, there's no, again, I don't really have a specific question, but I'm just it's, it's more in, in in those terms of of like you know different spheres on the internet, you know, kind of with, with, within their own different realities, who um, are just not kind of discussing with one another anymore, but just kind of seeing one another as an enemy. Um, yeah, that's something I still have a trouble to grapple with. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah, of course. And it has uh, very much to do with, uh, you know, future, future platform designs or future, uh, you know, social interaction uh, in the way we want to um, do that. As you, as you already say, um, it becomes so self-evident and uh, automated to exclude, you know, the, uh, the other, uh, the, online, uh, the online or offline other, the, the, the person you, you do not agree with. And so um, the idea that we have different opinions and different backgrounds, funny enough, um, you know, this whole idea of diversity and difference. Yeah, it's not really uh, very popular uh, today, right? It's, uh, we are retrieving in, uh, in very uh, exclusive um, tribes. That, uh, and this is probably what you see happening uh, across uh, the globe, but also inside societies, right? It's just we don't have a, a proper way to, yeah, to give that a name or a new name. Some people say, okay, these are all uh, dealt with through lifestyle. 
Uh, others say uh, it's very, very much uh, defined by, uh, by age and experience, right? A 25-year-old person can never meet a 35-year-old person, something like that, right? That, so there's that. Uh, increasingly, maybe even, uh, you know, selective forms uh, of um, uh, communication within ethnic communities and so on, so on, right? The tendency to close is very, very strong. Mm. And is felt like that strongly by everyone. And the social media are accelerating this and they are not counterbalancing it whatsoever. Um, so would you say that you have a optimistic or a, or a pessimistic view of the future of social media? I have a pessimistic, hopefully, you know, we will get rid of the social media as soon uh, as we can. And uh, oh, I'm together. very much a, a, a fan of, uh, let's say, um, a restart, a reinvention of, uh, of, uh, of the internet. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, and especially also within the European context, you know, um, if we see, um, yeah, how, f how fast uh, the, the United States is declining, but also if we see how, f how fast, uh, you know, the, the power of, uh, of China um, is, uh, is growing, uh, this immediately puts uh, up the question of, uh, you know, do we have any viable uh, European alternatives? Uh, and uh, this is a kind of a, a geopolitical way of looking at it, but it gives us a lot of possibilities, a lot of possibilities. And I'm very optimistic about that. Uh, I'm not really sure, uh, you know, if, uh, if we should uh, exchange, let's say, Facebook for WeChat and say, okay, we have to accept mm -hmm. that we are uh, dominated by China now and uh, see you on WeChat, you know, is this what we want? And that's uh, subtle, you know, that question, you could say, oh, well, that's far away, it sounds very hypothetical. But of course it's not, it's already there. If you talk to young people and, uh, you know, they're really in two minds what to make of TikTok. Uh, the, TikTok is a Chinese company. Mm. It's the most, uh, you know, popular uh, social media uh, for the, uh, let's say, under uh, 21 or under 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a huge uh, um, group. It's also the group now that protests most, uh, you know, most explicitly is involved in the Black Lives Matters, also in Europe, right? Well, there you go. There it is. How do you relate to TikTok? You know, do you make any second thoughts about uh, the influence of the Communist Party uh, of China mm. there? I'm just yeah. asking. I, mean, mm. uh, I don't have to uh, get an answer, but uh, we, we can say, okay, this is all theoretical, but uh, in my view, uh, it's not. I mean, I personally don't see why we should be more, why we should question a Chinese social media platform such as TikTok any more or less than, than, than an American one. I mean. No, of course, there you go. But then again, I'm saying that as American. <laughs> but, um, oh, I, don't I don't know which passport you have. I, I, I never ask. Huh? No? <clears throat> I mean, but, if, you I'm know, I, I would love to uh, meet on a Swiss, uh, you know, social media platform. You know, <laughs> where are you? What's, what's happening? Yeah, what's is happening everyone, actually? Is, is everyone asleep in Zurich or what is the situation there? Is, there's no urgency help to do something about this you know <laughs> we, we can look at china we can look at uh, silicon valley but uh, why mm -hmm. not look at zurich mm -hmm. huh? for that matter mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because we had another position like earlier in in position on and discourse of annika meyer a curator from berlin and in this 
um, format, we strongly talked about the necess necessity of for artists or freelance people to actually use these platforms as a tool to work and get jobs and all this kind of stuff. But um, yeah, we should instead of using them, we should just like invent new ones. But I hope so. Yeah, would probably be the solution. But yeah. So with, this, <laughs> with, with, with dismantling social media um, altogether, be is, is that is that is that an impossible an impossible uh, <laughs> projection? Yeah, it's, it's very possible. And uh, you know, <laughs> of course, you could say uh, you know if you read uh, Gibbon, um, the um, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, you can read uh, you know that it took uh, seven hundred years. Um, you know, is it going to take 700 years this time? I'm, I'm doubtful. Um, you know, if you go and read the uh, accelerationists, I, I don't know if you, if you, if you do, and uh, if you believe in that or not, and what to make of it. This is a real key, uh, key question, right? Um, the decline uh, of these things can happen almost overnight. Mm. We know that from the history mm. of the internet. We know there's, there's many 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 examples it just because of the stagnation of the last 10 or 15 years that we we were unable to imagine anything like that but even you know the the history of the internet it's, itself the let's say you know maximum 20 25 30 years there's, there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, examples where systems that had a monopoly with hundreds of millions of uh, users disappeared overnight, right? So we can be we can be uh, extremely optimistic uh, about that. Hmm? Do you also see a reason to be extremely pessimistic? Uh, well, uh, well, for me, uh, pessimism is uh, you know it's an exercise. It's uh, it's. it's, it's <laughs> Not a, you know, it's almost like a sports school. Uh, you, you need to really, uh, you know, go and train yourself into, into that. Um, also, um, yeah, I love reading, uh, you know, someone like, not, not just uh, Schopenhauer or Nietzsche or something like that. But uh, let's say you, Eugene Tacker, uh, the, 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 the most well-known um, uh, pessimist of uh, our time. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of uh, admiration uh, for 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 him, but I don't think uh, you know it comes naturally. Uh, all the forces, including your boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, family, uh, you know, your loved ones, um, all of them will fiercely, you know, undermine your efforts to train yourself in pessimism. Right? This is not done. Hmm? So. Um, and because, uh, you know, this is a cultural uh, act. Pessimism is not something, you know, that just is a, is a natural or a medical uh, circumstances. Don't confuse it with depression. You know, depression is very serious. I don't know if you people, if you know people who were or still are depressed, it's very, very serious, right? It's a medical state and it's uh, something uh, you, you cannot uh, wish anyone uh, not your friends or your enemies uh, to uh, end up in. Um, so, um, the pessimism uh, is a higher goal. You know, it's it's an, almost an ultimate uh, goal uh, for hum humankind to, to reach. Not something you get for free on the plate. Um, I have another one. <laughs> um, <laughs> how, how can we in, interpret um, the, the way in which the current um, American president is really kind of bringing social media in, in, into his sort of strategy and the fact that he's kind of, he kind of appears to be using it kind of loosely without any, you know, sort of filters or, 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 or PR specialists kind of, you know, um feel you know it's yeah. it's it's really interesting like i've never seen anything like this and no. um it's so interesting to see twitter be mentioned 
so many times every single day in the news on CNN. Yeah. Like, how how do we interpret this and what 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 to make well, out of it? Is, is it genius? Twitter is a very small uh, social medium, right? It's one of the smallest uh, social media that we know uh, in comparison to the bigger platforms. So Twitter is used to, in a very tactical and strategic way to communicate, let's say, with other opinion makers. So um, it's kind of a small platform for media makers. Most people in the world are not on Twitter, right? um, but they find out uh, what's going on there through other channels, right? So in a way, um, Twitter has a kind of replaced, uh, you know, the what what in the past uh, were called uh, news agencies such as Reuters and so on and so on, right? Yeah. Um, so um, so that it's kind of a um, it it amplifies something, and then this the real distribution happens elsewhere. Hmm? Um, but because it's unfiltered, and uh, you know. Um, that Trump uh, is making um, is making use uh, of that. I would, just for history's sake, I would like to remind everyone here of the fierce debate happening, you know, in let's say late 2016, just before, during, and after the 2016 elections, uh, inside uh, Twitter, what to do with the um, uh, Trump uh, case, right? And uh, there were very, very um, different opinions inside the Twitter company um, about uh, this, right? Uh, maybe you all remember the time when uh, just after his election, uh, in fact, um, uh, um, Trump himself wasn't quite sure, you know, who he was anymore. Was he, uh, uh, you know, was he Donald Trump or was he POTUS? Remember? Uh, um, is it, yeah, did he have to move? Uh, um, and then uh, the, the, the Twitter um, CEOs made uh, this, uh, in my understanding, a tragic and strategic mistake not to close down the, the Trump uh, account and say, now that you, you're president, uh, you um, you can uh, only uh, you know express yourself uh, through the official uh, channels the, that uh, exist there. They've not done that with uh, you know all the consequences uh, we we have uh, been facing in the last uh, four four years. However, um, Trump did not win uh, the 2016 election uh, because of Twitter. We know, and there's so much uh, evidence uh, about it that uh, this was done uh, with the help of uh, Cambridge Analytica using Facebook uh, do, through micro-targeting of very specific audiences. Uh, yesterday, BBC documentary came out, very, very interesting one, where we see a few minutes of a woman who was then the coordinator of um, um, Donald Trump uh, in the election campaign responsible for Facebook. I had never seen her. She suddenly shows up now, three and a half years later. And she takes the BBC documentary people to a place, an empty office, and she tries to explain like, okay, here were the, were the uh, Cambridge Analytica people sitting. And over there uh, were the, the Trump campaign people uh, were sitting and I was uh, you know, in charge of that team. And in the same room, we had executives of Facebook and of Google and Twitter sitting next to us. So you can imagine, yeah, try to imagine this Facebook room uh, with not only the companies, Cambridge Analytica, which is clearly a criminal organization, right? Has mm -hmm. been uh, labeled as such uh, after uh, for Ill illegally obtaining all these data. Uh, of Facebook, you know, who was sitting at the next desk in that same room, the war room of the Trump campaign. Okay, <laughs> now the question is, can this be repeated so easily four years later? My answer is no. Hmm? 
um, of course, we, 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 a lot of people are, are trying to follow what Trump is doing on Facebook, right? Ignore Twitter because uh, it's, it's not relevant. Hmm? Um, look at the investments uh, he's, he has to do and the, the way he's putting his Facebook team together to win the next election. I think uh, if we get a better understanding of that in real time right now, and if we are able to act to sabotage that election campaign, uh, there's a, there's a, a chance uh, you know, uh, of, um, of us uh, you know, um, really, um, let's say, changing the outcome. Hmm. If you yeah, want, well, huh? Oh, sorry. No, if you want to look at the the video fragment, it's really shocking. Um, uh, it's um, you, you can find it on the net in this BBC fragment. Yeah. That that's the name of the show, BBC Fragment. Um, no, I don't really know because I couldn't, I couldn't really find, um, where, you know, which exact BBC news item this came mm -hmm. from. It's clearly a news item. It's very, very valuable, uh, because a lot of people have been, you know, looking for this ever since, um, the first indications, by the way, of uh, Swiss uh, researchers, maybe you remember them, um, came out uh, about the existence of Cambridge Analytica, which was, um, you know, quite early on, in fact, uh, in the whole process. I think late, late, in December 2016, their first um, um, their first account came out. I think in the in the Zurich newspaper, but I'm not really sure where. Hmm. Anyway. Okay, it's now five to two. I think. There is room for a last question if there is one left. Has somebody Trinity? I'll lose space for someone else for once. And if not, I think I would like to thank you, Gert, for you know being ready for doing this experiment. We will dive a little, we will dive on a little for three days or something now and um, <laughs> have some more I hope you see it. and interventions. But, sorry? I want to come, so I, I'm, I am coming soon. So. Yeah, <laughs> looking it's forward. No? Yes. That's great. So thank you, thank you all for listening uh, and for contributing. And um, we will see in the Positionen and Discourse series next semester again. But come back to here in the next three days. There will always be something going on. Maybe you can tell a bit more detailed about the program that will follow. Yeah, exactly. Today is Monday. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we've been streaming since last Friday, where the opening from the Diploma Ausstellungen was here at the Zurich University of the Arts. And now we will have, tonight we will have one more program and mm -hmm. it will be a screening of a film of two um, people from the department Art Education Kunstpädagogik. And after that, they will talk about their master theses. And then tomorrow we'll, there will be a talk of curatorial studies and everyone who did a master thesis in curatorial studies and they will have a discussion together about all of that and then on wednesday there will be a lecture performance here in our dive-in pool 
by Nina Schäuble. And after that, we will have a last discussion about her master thesis and about actually this format, how it is for us to be filmed all the time. <laughs> and I forgot something now. I think hacking the discourse, right? Yeah, tomorrow there will be another thing going on. It's called hacking the discourse, but you can find all the details that I did not say now on the ZDK Art Education um, page on Curateria Digital. There's like really nice text about everything happening. But the room is streamed 24 seven. So whenever you are a bit bored or you need a nice background, you can zoom in on in the same link. Yes. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Basil, for also coming to the real room. Just, yeah, very, <laughs> very strange. Very strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back behind my screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too real, right? Mm. It's too real. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. <laughs> bye. 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 Nice bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. -bye. See you soon.